Good morning, everybody. Welcome to um, the first Watermark webinar of 2023. And I hope it's not too late to wish you all a very happy new year. And even though it's we're in March now. Um, I'm Caroline McAuliffe, a partner in the Watermark Interim Executive Practice. And I'm joined today by my colleagues in the interim team to welcome you all. We have enjoyed and had the great privilege to be able to host some amazing presenters over the past two years who've shared with us their wisdom and expertise on some very current and relevant topics. Now, if you've missed any of those webinars, please feel free to watch the recordings that are available on the website. Now we're facing into 2023 and there are so many unknowns. There's a potential interest rate driven recession. We're hearing geopolitical tensions, ongoing COVID impacts on supply chains, accelerating transition to a low carbon economy. That's just to name but a few. So many business leaders see 23 as a continuation of the most challenging environment management teams have ever faced. And how did we get here? You know, when we look back a year, Omicron was still spreading, logistics teams continue to struggle with fractured supply chains and amid record demand. We locally experienced terrible floods. And even so, there was this hope that the worst of the pandemic repercussions were over. And then last February, hope turned again to anxiety when Russia invaded Ukraine. Many businesses showed their support by withdrawing and the ensuing war ignited the worst humanitarian crisis in Europe since World War II, a global food and energy crisis and an acceleration of the negative disruptions already underway. In our world of work, the war for talent was already underway, as was the great resignation, you know, people re-evaluating what they wanted from a job and, and from life and employees left traditional employment for interim temporary gig or part-time roles, or starting their own businesses. And some quit because of life demands. They needed to care for children or elders. Health problems were persisting. Some workers were ready for a break and felt confident that they could find another job when they wanted one. And so today, a complex and varied set of forces is potentially introducing a new era. It's multiple sources of risk, but also opportunity and potential transformation. So leaders are weighing how technology, demographics, energy and resources, capital will evolve and affect their businesses. And with those forces in mind, we've asked Kieran to come and speak with us today about how teams can thrive rather than merely survive in this volatile environment by building both resilience and courage in their organizations. We're very happy to welcome to this session author and thought leader Kieran Duff. We're welcoming him back, actually, um, who will discuss the paradox of complexity and how, as complexity rises, many of the mechanisms that have worked well actually distract from the most important issues and then reduce confidence in delivery. So Kieran is an advisor and coach to senior leaders running complex projects and transforming organisations. He has redesigned and rescued multi-billion dollar projects and led business transformations. He's also a global presenter on using design thinking to drive step changes in project and business performance. He's the author of the book, The Complex Project Toolkit. So today's presentation will run for around 45 minutes. We'll have the opportunity to pose questions throughout using the chat box or the Q&A box. So if you can ensure that your options boxes are switched to visible to panelists and all participants, so then we can all see your questions and the discussion. Kieran's very happy to answer as many questions at the end of his presentation, and we'll also be posing some live polling questions. So this session, like all of our series, will be recorded and available to view via our website. So Kieran, without further ado, please provide some practical advice on what can be done to set up programs for success, but also improve confidence in delivering those that are already underway. Welcome, yeah. Kieran. Thanks, Carolyn. Yeah, we've got a um, huge response to this. So obviously it's a, a topic that's near and dear to a lot of people's heart. Um, yeah, I'm going to tell some stories. I'm keen to hear what's happening in people's world, what dramas are out there at the moment. I mean, it's such a broad topic. Um, I'm going to provide some, some framings and we'll talk about some of the concepts, but also drive it down to some practical things that you can do you know, tomorrow. 
to start to handle this. So we'll talk about the challenges. I'll give a framing of complexity. I think it's it's really useful because so many people have different ways to describe it. And then I'll talk about some of the mistakes that we make uh, because I think while it might feel a bit negative, focusing on um, turning around the common mistakes is actually a faster way to improve things. You know, if you've ever been in a sports team, you know that if you can reduce your mistakes, you, you lift the performance. Then I'll talk about ways of operating um, that work really well in complexity. And then we'll have time for discussion and questions. And then we'll finish up with the five things to help reduce complexity um, in your world. You know, keeping that to the end so it's the thing you remember. Uh, as Carolyn said, yeah, use the chat box for comments and, and questions along the way. So, yeah, complexity is really shifting. Um, Carolyn mentioned a bunch of things that are changing the world. Um, the ongoing supply chain instability, you try and work out what's happening in the market. You see some consulting firms exiting people and others still hiring. We see tech layoffs, but also um, lots of tech startups starting to, to grow. Um, there are some areas that are sh still short of staff and some that really don't know. And, and, and there's this interest rate cliff coming and all of these different things that we just don't know exactly how that's going to play out. That's driving the complexity, this uncertainty. I mean, there's, um, you know, the big headline at the moment, obviously, is chat GPT and all the things it's going to do. So I jumped on and asked it, will there be a recession in 2023? And it's a, the answer that it gave warmed my heart. What it said was, as an AI language model, I don't have the ability to pre predict the future events with certainty. So two things come from this. I mean, the, these technologies are true, but maybe not very useful. And when you're using these tools, they're looking back. And, and so it comes to us to be ready for the future, to see the patterns, to sense and respond. And so it's not about having complete clarity, but making our way through all of this complexity. And it's not just those macro trends. There's also the immediate context. Um, there was a report from PwC that said there's this big shift from la even just from last year to this year. Last year it was about growth and how do we you know, rebuild and now it's more of a productivity focus. Um, there was a BCG report talking about how employee buying has declined, uh, but now it's starting to return. And you start in when when the complexity goes up, you also tend to see slower decision making. People are more careful and and not placing bets as quickly. So if you take a moment to think about these trends or the the um, issues that are particularly facing you at the moment, the complexity that you face, um, if you put in the chat, um, what is the key driver of complexity for you at the moment? What do you think are the most significant issues for delivering projects this year? What we'll do is we'll take this chat and, and you know, the, the items in the chat and at the end of the session, we'll, put, we'll identify the main themes and then we'll put that out as a poll to, um, to then identify what, what are the, the, um, the common themes that people are seeing when it comes to complexity. Because there's a lot of value in knowing that you're not alone. Yeah, elections. Yep. Do not know where that's going. Oh, accountability is an interesting one. Oh, yeah. Access to the right staff is, I don't think that's ever going away. I think there's, you know, and on top of that, it's not just access to skilled staff. It's how are they operating? Uh, you know, are we bringing them back in the office? Are we operating distributed? Um, certainly from my perspective, it's great to get people in the room when you've got um, a high degree of complexity. Yeah, <laughs> I like that term, the good old days, um, getting everybody back in the office. There's a lot of debate about that. And that, you know, that's a real, real question. And that whole idea that last year was the, the great resignation and now we're going into almost the, what was it? The um, People are much more worried about maintaining their roles. Yep. 
Okay, so that's a good listen. Feel free to keep going with that. Like I said, we'll um, we'll pull some themes out of that, and towards the end, we'll um, bring that together into um, a, a poll to see um, where everybody's standing on those. All righty, so let's talk about um, complexity and framing complexity, because I think it's very useful to have the same way of talking about it. So the Kneffen framework by David Snow, and I've always found really useful, and, and probably a, a lot of you have, have seen this before. And he talks about uh, simple, complicated, complex, and chaotic. So simple are those things that are observable, predictable cause and effects, reasonably straightforward. You can plan these projects and um, that works well. Complicated are similar in that you can plan them well, but they take more expertise. So think more about um, uh, large system implementation where you can buy best practice and you can bring people into it. The thing that's of more interest though for me, and I think for us, is these, the complex side where there's the cause and effect is unclear. There's um, potential for multiple answers. Um, in this world, things are subjective. They're connected. Um, you need to experiment and look for patterns um, rather than knowing what the answer is. And the answer will depend on your background, um, what Rattel calls wicked problems. And then there's chaotic. Um, and these, these are rare Um Often it's negotiations um, where you have different opinions about how it will play out and you never know until you actually do it. Um, and this is also the area of teenagers. You ask them to do something, you've got no idea where it's going to end up. So, And sports. Sports are also chaotic. So if you split the world, um, as I do, between these two, really the, the right-hand side, the universe is complicated, but humans are complex. And it's that human dimension is what really drives the complexity. So given that, let's look at some of the common mistakes that we make. So these are, uh, when I look at uh, complex projects or people dealing with complexity, there's really these four ways of operating that get in the way. And the first one is that we get distracted. So this happened to me, I was running transformation up at Essential Energy, which is a distribution poles and wires business in, in remote and regional New South Wales. Um, and when I was there, we had the North Coast fires, the South Coast fires, COVID turned up, we had a mouse plague. So given fire, pestilence, plague, we we're expecting the four horsemen of the apocalypse to turn up, but they couldn't make it through because there were floods, right? We had a bid on. And um, it became quite a distraction for the business. Um, you know, I, I remember going out in the field, seeing these black and brown fields and some that were pink from the fire retardant. You pitch in, you help ops, you, you get thing, uh, you really get things done. Um, but really from a uh, transformation perspective, there was only one of those that I should have worried about. And that was COVID. That was the one issue of those that was driving up the complexity for the transformation program. We also had the issue of increased solar panels was actually a bigger impact because it was shifting the priorities of the program. So it's very easy to get distracted running these programs. And so then why do we get distracted? Well, often, you know, the, the, it's the loudest thing and we run towards the shiny. We like to help. And, you know, if I'm honest, I guess I think crises are interesting. You stick on the cape, you go and help. Um, but in transformation, we need to uh, maintain a long-term view. We like to see results, but we've got to have that long-term view. So in these situations, a really clear purpose, a belief, and what I call a territory map, which I'll talk a little bit uh, later, helps us to stop getting distracted. The next thing that we do is we have this bias for action, which is normally great. Um, but we step in quite quickly and we redirect attention or we start new things. You know, we reprioritize, which is, is good and bad. It's, it's, uh, it's bad when it's done centrally and without regard for all the uh, connectedness. It actually drives up complexity. Um, the other one is the haircut. Everybody gets you know the 5% reduction. And we know that doesn't change anything. It just drives it underground. You do it with BAU, becomes magic time um, where you get it done. Or you try and stop things, but Things never really get stopped. Um, 
But with this bias for action, we also go and start new things. I mean, I had, had a mate I was talking to the other month where he was running an uh, ERP system implementation, finance HR, and the way they designed that was that they were changing the processes to match the system. That's a fairly common way to do it. You'd say system probably has better ways of operating than we do, so we'll go with that. Separately in the organisation, they started a transformation program of the customer front end. And they decided that this, the, they would design the processes and change the system to meet the processes. Now you've got two, pro, two major programs running, but at, at, you know, they were conflicting because they hadn't taken the time to really join them up and it drove up the complexity. So this bias for action is something that we carry. And I think because originally we, we've known that you know, moving is good, we'll figure it out later. But I, I think it really comes from a discomfort with not knowing. Um, you know, there's the whole brain science around, uh, you know, I, I don't like this not knowing, so let's do something. Um, but I actually think it's it's more than that. I'd make the argument that we really don't know how to learn collectively. We take action because we're no good at thinking together. We haven't learned how to run good experiments. We haven't learned how to get people together in a room and genuinely question and reframe and think, what I call the, the 50 kilo brain. When you get a lot of people in the room with a good conversation, you can actually see so much more. So what we need rather than a bias for action is, is space to think and, and be willing to exist in the discomfort and, and hold multiple answers at once. Okay, the next common mistake is what I call more data, please. You know, increasing complexity increases nervousness. And often our response is, well, I want to get data. I want to know what's going on. I want to be able to prove it. We ask for, you know, more plans in more detail. Um, we want more detail around the resources that we need or the finances. Um, and in the extreme, you start to see steering committees they move from these monthly events to weekly, but it doesn't create clarity. That uncertainty still exists. We're just getting, um, we're seeing it more often. And all we're doing is updating the reports faster and exhausting those who are running the reports. And you might have seen this, um, if you've ever tried uh, diving into resourcing in detail, you know, at the top line, you work out what the resources are that you need. And then you think we need some more precision to it. So you pull it apart. And as you pull it apart and you go more and more into detail, it becomes more and more confusing. And you can't really slice it down. So this rush to data, um, this sort of spiral down into more detail actually creates more confusion. We might think it helps us, but really it doesn't. And in, you might have even experienced this when um, what I call this vortex of distrust that occurs. Somebody will say, oh, can you, can you explain X to me? Surely it can't be that hard. So you go and get an answer and you go back with that answer and they want, okay, give me a bit more information about it. So you dig a bit more. Now the answer is slightly different because you've found out something more nuanced. Um, so the answer, answer changes. And you go back again, and now the answer changed. And so there's no longer trust in the original number. So that's how we'll get more detail. And because of the connectedness of these situations, because they're subjective, because they're looking to the future and there is no certainty, the more detail you go into, the more confusing it becomes. I mean, if you've ever tried to define a productivity metric and you end up with two of them and this attempt to prove which one is right never works because they're standing on different concepts. You've actually got to bring this back up. So this, um, this dive into detail is, like I said, it, it'll cause confusion, but it feels right to begin with. You know, it's, it, and this is amplified by new tools. We get more and more information. Um, you, know, you end up dropping your head right into the details when certainly in complexity, you've got to be able to lift up and out. Um, so why do we do this? Why do we look for more data? I think fundamentally, we're scared of not knowing. We need to be the expert. 
And by getting data, we feel like we've got control. And like I said before, it's this discomfort of not knowing. Um, there's that whole brain science and, and, and the brain just doesn't like to be uncomfortable, doesn't like to be uncertain. Well, and data makes us feel more in control, but it doesn't actually. And if in the back of your mind, you know, you can't totally believe it. Um, and I think fundamentally in the way we operate, we give more precedence to data than we do to story. I think this is a really important point. I was talking to a mate who's running a massive infrastructure project about his metrics. And he said, deep down, I know where the project's at. I walk around and I can understand where it's at. The, the metrics are just going to tell me how much it's good or bad. And it was this idea that the answer's in the room. And so in complexity, we actually need a more humanistic approach. There's a great story from actually David Snowden when he's in, in that paper on the Kinefin framework where he talks about running a kindergarten session. And it was assigned to a bunch of uh, West Point graduates, so military graduates in the US. So this group put together you know, the, the plan for the one hour class and the contingencies and the alternates. And they were clear what their strategy was and the outcomes they wanted to achieve. And as you can imagine, within about five minutes, it all just went to hell in a handbasket because they were trying to control this environment. So when the teachers then came in, they watched what was it that they did. And they didn't try to control it. They looked more to amplify the good behaviours by getting the crowd to see this is how we operate and playing down the bad behaviours. So in that emergent complex situation it was more about leaning on the system to get the right behaviors to turn up rather than this this control mechanism all righty so the last one then is oh also i love this quote by samuel beckett it's this idea you know you dive into detail i'm still confused but at a higher level uh, because it really doesn't get to the heart of the complexity you find yourself spending a lot of time on stuff, not feeling like you're going forward. Um, the fourth common mistake is to hold course with what we're doing. You know, in, in the absence of a confirmed alternate direction, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. And part of this is, is sort of trying to ignore that whole overwhelm of complexity. I remember one project I was involved in. It was Project in Trouble. Um, the, it was about to get a lot more media attention because things weren't going well. So we, we got them all in a room. There's 20 leaders of each of the work streams in this massive program. Um, and it was this long room. You know the ones where the table's a little bit too big and it's very hard to get around. As soon as people are sitting at it, it's very hard to get past them. So it was it's really uncomfortable. Um, but once everybody was in there we were in there for a couple of hours talking through okay what's going on here what's changing what do we need to do different and it all just descended into quite a rabble and at the end the program manager just said all right we all know what to do we just have to get on and do it and you can see that's a response that that, that could work in complicated projects where the plan is good but in this complex emergent situation that wasn't going to work and you could see that everybody knew that they all nodded yep yep we've got our plan we've got our instructions but they weren't really dealing with the fundamental issues there and and why do we do this i think because people own the approach not the outcome they've got a way of attacking this and that is good they set it up but when you focus on the outcome you can actually see there's alternates there's also a confirmation bias which is one of the best biases. Um, it's, you know, it is a really dangerous bias. It, it kills, you know, having worked in aviation, I know confirmation bias can kill people. Um, but this, this desire to keep doing what we're doing because it's easier. And also there's this fear that changing could be worse. Like, you know, standing in a supermarket queue and the other one's moving faster and you think, oh, I'll swap across to there and now the one you were on moves but you're doing that with your career, you know, it's easier. It's, it's, it's easier to just hold the current plan rather than taking the time to think and change and do. So 
what we actually need to do in complexity is much more sense and respond and build the capability to help us understand those issues at the margin. All right, so they're the common mistakes. Let's talk about, um, oh, actually, yeah. here's a great quote too. You know, this idea that the more complex and novel the problem, the more um, non-standard approaches like sense-making, trial and error will give you better results. So as the complexity goes up, you need to be willing to try different things. If you remember back on the Kinefin pro framework on that left-hand side, the sense and respond, um, this willingness to test the environment and see what comes out because you know, there, there is no certainty bit to begin with. So you need to be able to operate in that environment very well. All righty, so ways of operating. Um, we now know what we do wrong. Let's talk about what we can do right. And the first thing is about connection. Um, if you do one thing in complexity, focus more on connecting with people. It's the one thing that will really shift. I mean, I'll talk about five things, but, but this is a big lever. Um, I was actually reading a BCG report on transformation and it was saying that what they've seen over the last few years is a drop in leadership's willingness to be involved, which is really scary. That to me uh, is a worry because you need to be connected. You need to have those conversations. When I started at uh, Essential Energy, one of the things I did do was sit down with all the workstream leaders and get really clear that we are making this up as we go along. We have to be able to sense and respond. We have to be able to have the conversation about what's going on here, what does it mean, how does it change, and don't assume we know everything. If you go and connect with a whole bunch of different people, one of the problems is you end up with too many ideas. So the counter of that and sort of the paradox of complexity is complexity requires simplicity. If you leave this as just a, a complex mess, it just overwhelms. So what we're looking for here is, is to simplify it with a model, a metaphor, or a story that, you, that, that has a, a bigger load carrying capacity. Um, when I was at Qantas, we were getting a lot of discussion about you know, new technologies, drones, augmented reality, uh, Internet of Things. You know, we should be doing all of this. And I created a model that had um, maturity on one axis how mature is the technology, and value on the other. And you can see anything that um, we're going to focus on, uh, things that are mature and high value. And there are a lot of these things that were potentially high value, but really immature. And we ended up with three bands. And so those you know, down at the low maturity end, we'll learn to play with or learn about. Um, another way to simplify is actually scenario planning. The way it simplifies is by when you've thought through different ways this could play out, it unloads the brain because when you start to see things turn up, you can go, all right, that looks like scenario four. And all of this is about standing back, looking up, looking to the broader picture. So simplify is really important in complexity so that you've got a, a story, a model, a metaphor, what, however you hold this thing, that you can place all these things in and you can see significance. The next activity you need to do, and I think we're really bad at this, is to hold space, to take the time to almost sit with nothing, open up, be willing to take the time for reframing, to think, to get ahead of the problem. And if you're generally going to do this, you've got to do it by giving up knowing. Be willing to rethink, reframe. Um, there's a great story about the Manhattan Project that developed the atomic bomb and, and Oppenheimer. On Fridays, they always had their symposium where they would take two, three hours to just go through and talk about, what was the term they, they talked about? Talk about the things we didn't know we know. And that was about bringing together these different ideas. So in complexity, that a willingness to hold space is really important. But it's also a project it's got to deliver. So we also need to be focused on actually finding a way. 
to get it done. And there's an example I've got where I got involved in a project. It had six months till the design was supposed to be signed off. The, the plan said it was going to be 12 months. And so what we did, we uh, looked at what were the constraints? What was the, the key thing that was driving that timeline? It was the sign-off process. So we completely redesigned that. I said, oh, you can't do that. There's probity issues. Those constraints weren't real. So we're looking for the big levers. We're looking for what constraints we've got that aren't real, but everybody believes. We completely redesigned that sign-off process. So instead of documents firing back and forth, we've got everybody in the room and you do a page turn and you still do the formal process, but at the end. And we ended up taking what was a 12-month plan bring it back to six months and delivering on time by willing to rethink and find a way. All righty. So that's all good, but you can see there's trade-offs here. Um, how do you know which one to move on when? And at the heart of this is really an understanding of purpose. It's about understanding the significance of what you're doing and it drives you through the fog of, um, you know, uh, of, of questions, of understanding, of uncertainty. And it really helps clarify what's important and make trade-offs. Um, there was one project I worked on where we had um, negotiating sick leave for an EBA. One group believed that if we increased the amount of sick leave, people would take more leave. And another group, the operational people, thought it would have no effect. And what we had to do there was come back to get really clear on what we believed and make a call, make a judgment call in that complexity. So what I'd like you to do, because um, we're just about to get into some questions here, I'd like you to think about your reaction to this. What opens up for you in this way of thinking about the world? And so we'll get into the, uh, we'll do some uh, questions and answers or discussions. Um, after the discussion, we'll wrap it up with some practical tips for each of these things to do tomorrow, next week on each of those. Um, but first up, I'll just check, Ali, uh, we're going to run a poll um, based on what people put in the chat in the beginning. Are we able to, okay, so what we're looking at is in your situation, which of these trends is creating the most complexity? I don't know if everybody can see the results coming out of that, but it's, it's quite interesting. 40% um, are saying fear of change, an old way of thinking by leaders. And at 30%, access to the right people. Yeah, don't, that one really doesn't go away. I mean, it's always been there. And 20% really dealing with that global uncertainty. So... When we we're talking before about these big shifts, these big changes, um, these big economic changes, uh, I think it still comes back to most of us see that the 60%, 70% of the, uh, the issues we're dealing with is you know, the same ones we've always had to deal with. Righty, um, let's open it up for questions. Carolyn, have you Yes, I've got some? a question here actually for you, Kieran. So yep. Jack, from Jackie F. I love this model and naturally feel comfortable with it, but interested in your strategies to bring others on the journey of being comfortable in complexity mm. by getting to simplicity on the far side of complexity. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, 
I think that's the biggest question because there's this weird thing that I've seen that generally higher up in organisations, the more you want the data and the more you want certainty um, because it's a way of gathering that together. I th There are some mindsets and skills you need to bring to the table um, and it's a bit of a journey for some. I don't think, I, I really see that there are sort of three types of people when I start talking to them about this, particularly about the role of conversation. There are those who it bounces off them. They just resist it. Um, there are those who are intrigued by it and it opens up a listening for it. And then there are those who love it, jump on it, but sort of love it a little bit too much and see it as a way of not doing the real work because it does take real work. Um, and in terms of bringing others on the journey, there's a term I came across many years ago, and it was called um, speak to their listening. You need to understand what they're listening for. So there's no point getting everybody in a room to, to discuss a future or possible alternatives when the person's listening for the numbers for this month. So you've got to tick off that deliverable before moving forward. That's really important. True. Yeah. Speak to their listening. You, yeah. and, and that requires empathy. That requires you to be a good listener first. I, I, I call it listening between the lines almost. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and the whole conversation as a toolkit is really important. So for me, conversation is, isn't just a chat. It's, it's a structured process. And it comes from um, asking good questions listening um, in a generative way and, and by that I you know we you know we talk about active and passive listening now I'm more talking about knowing that you've got automatic listening often you're listening for the break in the conversation to get your point in rather than listen for their brilliance listen for what's important to them so it's on us first to move that yeah we've got a chairman who says two ears one mouth right yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> the, the other thing that's really useful is, and, and one of the things I've seen work well to start to move people, is do more on visuals, more drawing, because visuals, as we know, and visuals and stories are two really important capabilities, um, activates a different part of the brain, creates something bigger, and particularly, I think, a real breakthrough comes when you start to get their stories yeah. and you start to understand their fears and questions and problems that are inherent in their stories. Mm -hmm. And like I said, unless you're, you're delivering the, the numbers that they need to begin with, it really is about, um, you're not going, it, it'll bounce off. Yeah. Just a quick one, Kieran, um, from Malcolm here, um, following on from the poll. So how do we find the best arguments to reluctant leaders to take to help them accept that this is, they need to be adaptive in their thinking. Yeah. Because one of the biggest issues is, you know, that lack of um, listening or understanding or being adaptive and not yeah. being with the times. How do we go about that? I think you need to understand why they're not adapting, why they're not listening. Again, it will come back to that, that listening point. In fact, what I might try doing, let me see if I, if I can make this work. Um, I'll just draw a couple of things here. Um, I'm going to try and share the screen, see if the iPad comes up. What this comes down to is a couple of dimensions that, that really underpins this. What, one of them is, oh, is that working? Let's go here. We've got almost this think and act dichotomy. And we also have, as I'm saying here, there's connect or control. And the traditional way of thinking, particularly when we see things are complicated, is to operate in this world of keep moving, control this world, give me the data. And so you need to understand or, or work out how to move people more to this world of the importance of thinking, how to drive them up that scale, and how to see that connection is more important. 
And if you can break it down to those two, you know, and it will absolutely swing on the individual. You know, how do they think about the world? Do they value thinking? Are they just out of time? It occurred to me that we also need to kind of create safe place, don't we, for people mm -hmm. to be really honest and transparent about how things are going. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, so what's your thoughts on that? The cult, you know, how do we create that culture of safety? Yeah. Uh, so that we're actually getting everyone speaking up. Right, right. There, there's a couple of things. I mean, in my book, which I'll talk about in a moment, there, there are some mindsets there. And I think one of the strongest ones is, uh, or the, particularly for technical people, one of the hardest things to do is to give up knowing. Because we believe we're paid and we can fund our house on holidays because we know stuff. But as you become the leader, it's not about knowing stuff. It's about bringing it together from other people and being able to connect. And so in my mind, there are a whole bunch of skills and capabilities and mindsets that help us move more to a, a view on connection. But if the person you're dealing with doesn't see that, and, and actually, you know, I go back to the Kinefin framework often, people find this you know, where it's simple, complicated, uh, complex, and chaotic. I found that to be quite a useful framing, particularly for those who are technical and engineers. They go, okay, I get it. There are, you know, the complicated side, and that's where it's valuable. And if you can get people to take on that this is this complex side, isn't easy, and it, and it, you know, decisions get revisited and it's all based on worldviews. Um, I find that's often a first good step for framing and people starting to think about it. But that whole question of how to move people, it's a long journey. Um, and yeah, if we could give them that here's the, you know, the pill to take or the poor things to do next week, um, we'd have it done. Mm. It's, it's, it's come up a couple of times in the in the chat here. How do you help leaders, Chris has said, um, who got to where they are by knowing it all. To right, absolutely. In. So it's about vulnerability then, I suppose. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, knowing and, and saying, I actually don't know this. I'm not the smartest person in the room. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you're never going to win by telling somebody their kid's ugly. Um, you can't just say, hey, you're wrong. You don't have to be the smartest person in the room again. Um, again, I think it's about exhibiting the behaviours and giving them the experience. You know, it, it's beyond, quite often it's beyond their experience. And if they don't have the listening for it, it's not much you can do about that. And, and so the first thing you've got to do is, is create that possibility. And I've seen that work. Um, I'm just going back to one place where I ran a workshop and they saw the difference that it created. And so others would then, hey, can you come and talk to us? Not sure what's going on there. And, and people picked up different things. Like that give up knowing was a big thing. One was very focused on listening and building listening skills. And another one put in some operating principles about how they would meet each week and what they'd check in on. So it's different things for different situations, but it is about, standing on this belief that we have to move it, you know, in a certain way. Yeah, and, and we've got Dino's made a comment here, as you said before, speak to their listening, but then we need to take a stance as leaders to move the thinking. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, um, and that, is, that is really hard. In fact, if you know of Elliot Jacques' levels of work, where it talks about horizons people deal with, there's a rule in that that you can't operate above the level of your boss. So if you're working for somebody who's got like a, a system view or a supervision view is dealing with this week and next week, it's very, very hard to move beyond that. It becomes very frustrating. So often not simple. But most, I, I think, um, you know, fundamentally in complexity, you've got to move to this learning mindset. Projects often have a control mindset. It's scientific. And actually, you know, that's the whole argument of the book, actually, is that we have, we've grown up with a control mindset we have to move to a learning mindset and and it's all right to make mistakes right because we'll learn from them is that you know that idea of 
it's okay you know yeah but, but then learn quickly and don't do it <laughs> yeah and, and it's it's easier to say that Fail here quickly. on a zoom call um but you know these are significant you know major changes and every executive um, who gets to a senior level has had to learn to run one of these programs. Yeah. You've had to learn to, or you've had to have delivered in the, in the complexity. I can't see any other questions clearly, but if there is any. I'm just thinking in terms of time, we might keep moving. Now I'm, I'm happy to continue conversations. I'll, I'll put up my details and people can certainly, um, yeah. you know, I think it's been a, a, a a great discussion you know we've got the um let me just get the pages back up again make sure that's all righty um so yeah it's a uh, great discussion um like i said you've, you've got to have this capability to move people to be successful um, we talk, you know, you can look for the for the data and most of most of the data you'll find says about 70% of our large projects don't deliver, depending on how you measure deliver. So you want to be part of the 30%. Um, and, you know, you can see this topic's, of, you know, my obsession, you know, my intent here is to take um, the, the thinking of this and turn it into practical tools. So before we get into what to do next, um, this is a bit about me. Um, you know, the book's available, uh, jump on LinkedIn. In fact, I've got a website now um, and you can get on there and, and download the, the introduction if you want. The other thing I do there is I put together a monthly summary, you know, like an information diet, um, different models, different suggestions. And, you know, that would come out once a month. And if you were to sign up for that, I think over the next year, you'd probably find three things that, yeah, okay, kind of boring, I know that. Half of them might be confirm something you were thinking, confirming your understanding. A couple will open up new opportunities, but my intent is one of them is going to just shift your way of thinking. Mm, and and Kieran, we're going to distribute the slides, aren't we? Yep. And, yeah, uh, yeah. This document, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, to everybody. That, yeah, and, and I like I said, I'm, this is a passion topic for me, and so I'm happy to discuss that with people. Um, all righty, so things to do differently. When we look at this, um, and as I said before, it's a, it's a big topic, and the intent here is to frame it a couple of ways so that you can access it. Now I'm going to go down in some real detail of what would you do differently on this. So for connect, you've got the people that you work with, the peers, subordinates, seniors, connect with two people outside that group. If you do two people a month, it'll give you a whole new perspective. If you do two people a week, it'll shift your world. Connection goes to conversation, all that sort of stuff. But if you take on just connecting with others, it'll just open up your mind. Um, simplify. A model, a metaphor or a story Pick the most complex and uncertain, like I did with the maturity value um, model at Qantas. Make up a metaphor, make up a diagram, hold it lightly, let it change, but get your brain thinking about how can I simplify this world? And by the way, it's going to be wrong. It's going to keep changing, but that's okay. Putting the thinking into stepping back, looking across absolutely makes it easier to um, handle complexity when it turns up. You can see where it goes. You can place it somewhere. Um, hold space. As an individual, take an hour a week by yourself with a piece of paper. Sit in a coffee shop, sit in a park, go to the beach, whatever it is, but try and find a, a place where you can listen to your own voice. Because as I kept telling my team when I was running up at Essential, trust your gut. It's probably right. It's this knowing versus proving thing. You're experienced, you know stuff. Um, sometimes this voice will come out when you're sitting in a meeting going, yeah, that's not right. So give yourself the time, hold space for yourself. Do it for your team too, but, but the one step would be hold space for yourself. 
And when it comes to find a way, I'd like you to think about what constraints aren't real. Because as I mentioned, complexity is subjective. You have the power over it. Look for the biggest levers, but really question what are the um, what are the stories you're telling yourself about what you can and can't do? And then for purpose, I mean, it's not really a thing to do next week, but it's this concept. And, and you know, the main thing is to make sure the main thing remains the main thing. Know what this is about. Have a long view. Don't get distracted by the shiny because it's very easy to do. So I want to leave you with this one thought, that complexity basically comes from the different opinions that people bring. So as a leader, we need to bring people together and, and understand worldviews. So I can make the argument that as a leader, complexity is your fault. So the world might be changing, but the complexity you see actually comes from your reaction to it. But the upside of that is if you embrace that you're actually enormously empowered to handle this complexity. It's all about leadership. As I said before, the universe is complicated. It's humans that are complex. <laughs> so thanks for spending the time. Excellent, Kieran. Thank you so much, everyone. Any more questions before we close? I think we are out of questions and um, near the hour anyway. So look, Kieran, thank you again for, and everyone for attending. And I hope you found this session really useful and valuable. We will be distributing the information. Um, and if you have any further questions that you'd like to pose to Kieran, please link in with him yeah. um, and you know, um, look at his book, The Complex Project Toolkit. That's available online, Amazon, Booktopia, Dimex, all over. Um, and actually, yeah. it's now available in India. As in of this India. Week. Yeah, yeah, so that's <laughs> pretty good. cool. But yeah, and, and if people are, are deep in this and struggling with these issues, drop me a note. Let's yeah. have a half hour chat or something. I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm interested to collect stories and mm. spend time. But your so. next book, Kieran, is that right? <laughs> Ah, the next book. Yeah, that's actually about, at the moment, it's called Warning Signs, How to Know When Your Project's Going Bad. But oh, look forward to that. Maybe it'll be the 50 kilo brain. I think that's that's a little bit more interesting. So Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Um, and to everyone who's attended, um, watch out for our next uh, webinar in our series. Um, and thank you for joining us. All the very best to everybody. Have a good day, everyone. Bye. <laughs>